so excited to be here. Good morning, ladies. You know, I've learned that when Jesus invites you to do anything for him, the answer is always yes. And so uh, my name is Carmen Maxwell, and I am married to a gift. His name is Steve Maxwell. We have two amazing children, Kathy and Michael. And in fact, on uh, December 24th, we had a baby. And what a beautiful gift for Christmas. Um, and I have the most amazing job in the whole world. I get to hang out with some radical modern day heroes at SOS Ministries. And so if you're here from SOS, let's give God a shout. <laughs> okay, so super excited about that. And I just want to honor the UR team because these women truly have the heart of Jesus to bring God's daughters home. And I'm so honored to call them my sisters. And so we cannot be here without honoring them. So let's give them a shout out. <laughs> and so with that, let's just go to the Father. Father, we just come before your presence and we say you are God. And we love you and we desire that you would come and meet with us. Father, at the end of the day, we came to hear from you. We came to meet with you. And so, Jesus, we give you the freedom to be God in this place. We invite your kingdom to manifest in any and every way. Father, amaze us with your presence. Father, we want to know you and make you known in this place. So glorify yourself here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, the word of God says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. He was with God from the beginning. Without him, nothing was made. And through him, all things were made that have been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Or has not been able to overcome it. And so, you know, have you ever really thought about that the God that we serve made this world in six days? And think about that. In six days, everything that we consider valuable and that we're trying to understand, he made in six days. He made the human body in half a day. In half a day. Read it. It's there. You know, he took the other half to make other things, you know, <laughs> because he had time. And, and the incredible thing is everything that we consider amazing, he did it in less than a week. And that is the God that we serve. And that God knows your name. That God is love, and he desires to have a personal relationship with you. That God reaches down and invites you into a relationship with him. If you would but take his hand and walk with him. And so um, this is my story. At the age of 25, I found myself in my bedroom in this place where... Um, I had just found out that my husband had gotten a 13-year-old girl pregnant. And I knew he was on drugs. But how do you wrap your hands around that? Like, how do you, how do you, I mean, you know, just devastated, heartbroken, spiraling really fast. And at the place where I, I was too upset to be angry or shocked, I was afraid, <laughs> just really afraid. Like, where do you go from there? But it was in this place that I cried out to, to God. And the truth is, I didn't know God. I said, God, if you're real, if you're real, get me out of this place, and I'll find out who you are. In a matter of two horrifying weeks, God brought so many things to the light. And I moved into, in with my sister, and he moved in with his girlfriend. And I, like, how do you start over? <laughs> how do you start over? And with no tools and nothing to start over with, I started going to clubs and trying to quiet the voices inside of my head, because we all hear voices, right? Trying to quiet the voices in my head and trying to, um, to, to figure out, you know, the rest of my life. And so in this place, um, what, uh, I decided, you know, but the incredible thing is at night, I would hear this voice that sounded a lot like me <laughs> that would say, if you're real, get me out of this place and I'll find out who you are. Like, like how do you try to find God? It's like trying to hug the air, right? And I would argue with my own voice, you know? It's like, I don't know how to find you. It's like trying to hug the air. I don't know how to find God. 
Okay? So, but the Word of God says that if we will draw near to God, then He will draw near to us. And I find myself going to a church. And in this church, the preacher was saying things like, if you don't have a personal relationship with God, if you don't have peace with God, if you were to die today and God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you tell him? And I was like, what would I tell him? Like, I know I deserve to go to hell because I know me, right? I mean, I was just there, okay? And, and but something you know, I wanted to know more. And I remember going forward thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get there, but I'm going forward. And I went forward and I asked, all I could say was, can you please tell me what it means to be saved? And I remember the pastor called his wife over and, and I was at the end of my rope, you know, hurting people, hurt people. And I was in that place of anger and unforgiveness. And, you know, all the hurt was, was all bound up inside of me. And I remember telling the pastor's wife, I was like, um, I really don't want your opinion. I've heard opinions all of my life, and I really need truth. So if you can't share truth with me, I'm going to walk out right now. And I remember the pastor got off the pulpit, and he addressed the crowd. It was about 300 people. And he said, I want us to pray. Carmen has just asked for us to explain salvation to her, and I want us as a church to pray that she'll understand. Scared me to death. Okay, I, I said, all of these people are going to pray for me. Like some of them were laying on the floor in their face. Okay, like for me, prayer was like, I'm going to pray for you. And it's like a blessing, but people really don't do it. I mean, that's what was to me. Okay, but these people were like, they were for real. Like I could hear them. Okay, it was scary. And, and, and I said, all these people are going to pray for me. And she said, yeah, I said, but they don't even know me. She said, but God knows you. And I remember... And as she took me to the back, she began to share, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descendant, nor of human decision, but born of God. Then at that place, I had a divine encounter with truth. I realized that when Jesus died on the cross, that he did it for me. Yes, he did it for the whole world, but at that moment, he had done it for me. Because I needed salvation. I needed forgiveness, and it needed to be personal. Okay? Because this is where I needed healing, right here. And I had to invite Jesus into this place because this is where restoration needed to happen. And I remember I got down on my knees with everything I knew how. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart to forgive me of my sins and to become the Lord and master of my life because life was too hard and I didn't want to be God. And it was in that place that when I stood up, I was free. For the first time in my life, I felt peace. For the first time in my life, the love of God, real love, had entered my soul. And I wanted to stand up on my car and say, world, I get it. Jesus is the answer. I wanted to do that, but I did the next best thing. I ran home and told my mom. I said, Mom, you're not going to believe this. Like, like, I went to this church, and I, and I was just going, and my mom's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, I know you're going to that church, and there's nothing I can do about that, but don't be coming to my house saying you're saved. And she opened the door, and she said, you can leave now. And my mom, not understanding, you know, not, not being there where I was and, and all of a sudden like my head spun and I was standing there going oh my gosh I have 11 sisters and she's going to call them and I better know what I'm talking about okay <laughs> because I don't know what just happened but that was real life just got real so I went to Kroger's and I bought a bible <laughs> and, 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 and so for three days I didn't work I didn't sleep I didn't eat. I decided I need to know what is in this book because if it's real, then I need to know that. And if it's not, I'm going to close it and pretend this never happened because life is real right now. And as I began to read the Word of God, it was about the third day. All of a sudden, God began to speak. And you know, the thing is that when we invite Jesus into our heart, the knower comes to live inside of us. And the knower wants to have a relationship with the Father. And the knower knows the Word of God. And all of a sudden, the Word of God began to speak. And it said, single, barren woman, 
you who never bore a child. Shout out loud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her that has a husband, says the Lord. Stretch your ten curtains wide. You will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in the desolate cities. Do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer who is called the God of all the earth. And all of a sudden, it was like the knower sent a download into my heart. And all of a sudden, I knew, I knew that I would have lots of spiritual children. And I knew that I belonged to Jesus. I knew that I knew. And... And it was in this place that I surrendered to the will of God. I said, Jesus, if that's what you want me to do, whatever that looks like, because I have no clue. Remember, I'd only been a Christian three days. <laughs> I surrender. You know, people say that Jesus becomes all you need when Jesus is all you have. It's all I had, and it was more than enough. Okay, and so it was in this place that, that uh, I decided, okay, well, then I better know what I'm talking about again. So I got into every single Bible study I could, and, and people like, they didn't even want me in their Bible study classes because I would ask too many questions and wouldn't let nobody else study because I needed to know, okay? <laughs> I joined every single ministry that I could and, and wanted to be a part of everything that God was doing in our city. In 1993, there was 57 gang-related shootings in Bryan. And it was in this place that I decided, since God has a plan for my life, I'm going to go into the streets and talk to those kids. And I went out there and started this little Bible study with my little gang member kids. <laughs> and one of them got shot. Like, it was only a week old. And one of them got shot. And they asked me to go to the hospital to pray for their friend. And we went to the hospital to pray for their friend. He was in ICU. And so I put my hand on the door. And we were all praying for, for this boy that had gotten shot. And... And when I opened my eyes, J.J. Ramirez was right there next to me praying for the same door. Now, me and J.J., we were not, like, friends for a long time because, like, he was my ex-husband's drug dealer. And so, but, you know, a few, a few, a few, so a few weeks before, a few weeks before that, I had seen him. He had come into the salon where I worked, and he actually had told me, you know, he walked in, and I remember looking at him, and, and all of a sudden, I didn't hate him anymore. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm trying to live right for Jesus. And I said, I can tell, because I don't hate you anymore. <laughs> you know, because God has a way of breaking that dividing wall and bringing children out of darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus. And so it was in this place that Jesus, I mean, that, that J.J. <laughs> invited me to a prayer meeting at his house. And I was like, okay. So went to this prayer meeting, and there was J.J., who was an air-conditioned man. There was Arthur Hernandez, who was a concrete man. And J.J. was an ex-drug dealer. Arthur was a, an ex-drug user. And there was um, Albert Contreras, who was a pesticide control guy. And then there was a 15-year-old boy and a hairstylist, yours truly. And that was our prayer meeting. How about that? <laughs> but you know, God, who is God all by himself, uses the foolish things of the world. Because one thing we had in common in our little Jesus pampers is that we knew that Jesus was the answer to the problems in our city. And as we began to pray, God put it on J.J. Ramirez's heart to have a tent revival in the worst part of our city. And so what started, and he decided on October 31st, because we were going to take back our city for the kingdom of God. And so on October 31st, there was a prayer meeting that happened that took a block long. The people in the city got wind, and they came out to pray. And so what started out to be a two-day revival ended up a three-day revival. It was slushy, icy, cold, and freezing, but the kids showed up. And we even made our flowers like they were hand-drawn, and we made copies at Apple. You remember Apple Tree? We made copies at Apple Tree, <laughs> and we passed them out, and the kids came. And there was, like, so many kids out there. And the glory of God fell in the tent. 
it fell. And that's the only way I can explain it because the kids were on their faces crying out to God and asking God and repenting of their sins and asking Jesus to come into their hearts. And all the believers that were there, like me, like everything religious fell off. Like it was just Jesus. And who cares about anything else? It's just Jesus. And, you know, I couldn't even stand still. I was jumping up and down. And, and God was amazing. The altar was full of gang paraphernalia. There was drugs. There was, there, was, there was stuff. Like, I don't even know what some of that stuff was. But it was everything the kids were getting rid of. And afterwards, the kids came to us and they said, you know, we want to live different lives, but we just don't know how. Will you teach us how to live differently? And I remember going home because, you know, I already had a plan. I already had a, I already had a, I already had a plan. So I wanted to know, okay, God, what do you want me to do with this? Like, I, I can give all my money to this because, you know, I like to work. And, and I, can, I can pray because I, I do like to pray. Or, or I can disciple. Like, I don't know about that because those kids are crazy. But, you know, if you, <laughs> if you want me to disciple, like, like I, I mean, I, I guess I can do that. And, you know, and again, I believe that God can speak consecutively through the Bible anywhere. And I happen to be at the Great Commission. And I know the Great Commission. Like, I had read it, studied it. Like, I know it. And all of a sudden, again, the knower begins to speak. And he says, go into all the world and make disciples. Like, the one thing I didn't think I could do. Like, I can give money, right? I, I, can, I, I can pray, disciple. Okay, God, but what do you teach kids like this? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Teach them what I have taught you. It's like, okay, God, but like they have guns. <laughs> okay, like they're, they're not nice sometimes, like, you know? And, and he says, but lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And so if Jesus, if you go with me, let's do this, okay? So yes, I said yes to God. And, you know, our surrender sometimes is just yes, okay? I may have had plans for my life, but yes to God. That's where surrender comes in. Not my will, but let thy will be done. So I go to my first Bible study. There's about 35 teenage girls. And the, I break up three fights before I ever get in there. I've never had a fight in my life. I used to be really meek and quiet. They delivered me from that. So, <laughs> so I break up three fights, and nobody's paying attention. They're taking bats in the back to see who can make me cry first, and I'm about to cry, but I decided not to, just to spite them. <laughs> so they, uh, they uh, you know, uh, I saw, so okay, so I've been studying five, for five years, and I'm saying this because I know God has a sense of humor. So for me, it wasn't what Bibles to do I teach, but which one. Right. So I thought, I'm going to teach these kids about prayer. They're going to see God answer prayer, and they are going to be, they're going to be believers. And so I talked to them about prayer. Not that they were listening, but I was talking. And all of a sudden, I told the girls, Does, do any of y'all have any prayer requests? And the first girl raises her hand, and she said, I want you to pray that my parents will get a divorce. She goes, never mind, never mind. I want you to pray that my father will die. I said, why do you want your father to die? She goes, because I hate him. I said, well, I can't pray for that. She goes, well, then don't pray. Okay. So then the next girl raises her hand, and she'd been looking for love in all the wrong places, and, and you know, her, her dress was a little bit more revealing than I would have liked. And she says, um, I want you to pray for me and my boyfriend because we're in love. I said, next. So, <laughs> so the next girl stands up. And she does this catwalk across the room. And there was a pole in the room. Like, I don't even know where it came from, but it was in the room. And she does this thing around the pole. And she says, I want you to pray that when I grow up, that I will become an exotic dancer. Because that's always been my life dream. And the Bible study was over. And... <laughs> And so I, I go to the bathroom because I'm trying to relieve my eyes. And there's a girl that she's already crying. Her name is Erica. And she says, I said, Erica, are you okay? She says, I hate my life. I wish I could just die. She goes, my mother's boyfriend keeps having sex with me, and nobody does anything about it. I said, does your mom know? She said, yes. I said, well, if you will give me his name and number, I will make sure the police finds out, and it's going to stop. And so she gives this ray of hope and writes it down, hands it to me, and I'm against the wall. Like, I've never gone to the police. Like, I'm scared of police. Like, I don't know what to do with that. And I walk out, and there's this little girl. Like, like I was thinking, she should not even be here. Maybe nine, maybe ten. 
you know, she didn't even, like her body was still a baby. And, and, but she was cute as can be. You know those Hispanic girls with black, long, shiny, wavy hair with the big Hispanic eyes? And she was holding this Barney doll. And I was like, okay, that's, she's cute. I'm gonna go talk to her. And I got down on one knee and I, and I sit, and her friend Laura says, uh, Susie wants you to pray for her. And I said, okay. I said, Susie, what do you want me to pray for? She said, well, she said, Laura, you tell her. She goes, well, Susie's pregnant and she wants to have a girl. I said, Susie, how old is your boyfriend? She says, well, he's 18, but I'm not sure if this is my boyfriend's baby or my father's baby. So I got up and walked out. I go, and I, I didn't even pray for her. And I went to my car, and there was a, all the boys had ransacked my car. and They told me I'd been jacked, which means I'm not going to get my stuff back, but that's okay. So I'm leaving. <laughs> and I go to my house, and... I got the five years of Bible study in the trash, and I just, I didn't have enough strength to stand, and I crawled on the side of the wall, and I sat down, and I started venting, you know, that's what spiritual people do, right? I, I started venting, I was like, God, they don't even like me, and I don't even like them, and that baby has, that she's pregnant, and, and I have to call the police, and, and I, and, and all of a sudden, the knower begins to speak inside of my heart, and he says, do you love me? And I heard him, I mean, I read it. He told Peter that, right? So I knew the answer. I was like, well, Lord, you know that I love you. And again, the knower sends a download in my heart. And he says, Carmen, what you're about to do, you cannot do it for yourself because you're about to make a lot of mistakes. And you cannot even do it for those kids because it's going to be a long time before they're even grateful. And you can't even do it for your church because sometimes they're not going to understand. But if you do it for me because you love me, then one day I will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And that will have to be enough for you. And so for 25 years, I have had the privilege of leading um, at SOS Ministries, leading our women, leading our teenage girls, because I love Jesus. And that has to be the motive behind anything that we do for the kingdom of God. And, you know, as, as, you know, even in my own life and in the life of the women that I lead, a lot of times when we, like, want to get a hold of Jesus and we want to walk with him, sometimes things don't get fixed right away. Like, sometimes our kids, like, they know we're Christians and they still cuss at us. Like, sometimes they do. Like, sometimes, you know, the kids at us, they still do that sometimes, you know. And sometimes our marriages don't work out right away, you know. And sometimes things, they, they, just, they just don't happen right away. And then we read verses like, cast your cares upon him because he cares for us. And as we read these verses, we, we go into the throne room of God, and we, we do. We throw all of our problems, everything that we are, at the kingdom of God, and we should. But then, like spoiled children, we walk away. And I have this vision of, of God the Father, who is the creator of the universe, who has all the answers to life's problem, sitting in his throne room with all of our broken toys, our broken relationships, everything that hasn't worked out, but we're nowhere to be found. And, and beautiful women, that was never his heart. It was always his heart that you would stay and that you would take his hand and that you would walk with him. Because see, the thing is, what good does it do if, you, if he fixes your children, if he fixes your situation and they are walking with Jesus and they have character and integrity and you're still sabotaging your own, your own happiness because he knows what happened to you at five years old and he's trying to fix that. He's trying to restore that. He's trying to make you whole because you see all of these things, all of these relationships are actually gifts from God. Your children, your marriage, your friends, they are actually gifts from God. Either you're going to be a gift to them or they're going to be a gift to you. But they are gifts from God. And the beautiful part is that as we walk with Jesus, he wants to teach us, restore us, and teach us how, give us the tools to be able to utilize these gifts to their greatest potential so that they can be enjoyed, so that they can be cherished. God truly desire is that we really would have heaven on earth. But it happens, it happens as we walk with him. You know, it took a long time for me to get messed up, and I can't expect to Jesus to do it in two weeks, okay? I was 25 before I came to know him. So how do we do this? We spend time in his word. We spend time in his word. You know, the word of God says in Psalms 19:7, the law of the Lord is perfect, 
restoring the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Do you need your soul restored, converted? Do you need to have a heart full of joy? Do you want God to give you wisdom in the simple places? And wisdom is knowing the thoughts of God for any situation. Do you need God to give light to your eyes to penetrate any darkness that is in your soul, especially those deep, dark places that you don't want anybody else to know, but, but the monsters inside of you are loud and you want them to be healed? And do you want God to make you pure? Because only he can. And the Bible says that he does it through his word. And that's why he wants us to stay to stay in his word, because it has the power to proclaim the dawning of a new day. God wants us to enter into his throne room. The Bible says that at the cross, the, cur the, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. The curtain that separated the holy presence of God from man, from sinful man, all of a sudden at the cross, Jesus had given us access into the very throne room of God. And, you know, the disciples, they saw Jesus do a lot of incredible things. The lame could walk, the blind could see, the resurrected people, and, and even the 5,000 were fed. And he, they saw it all. But at the end of the day, he said, Jesus, teach us to pray. They had seen Jesus talk to the Father, and they're like, that's what I want. I want to talk to heaven like that. And, I, and then Jesus began to speak to them and says, and when you pray, recognize that God is your Father. And that he is a good father. And he wants to provide he, because a good father provides for his children. A good father protects. A good father teaches. And a good father even disciplines in love. Because only a good father will do that. And the Bible says also, he says and, and that he is your father and holy is his name. And because he is holy, he is set apart. And there is absolutely no sin in God. And because there is no sin in God, he is completely pure and he is all love. And so when he makes a decision for you in your life and you invite him into the decisions of your life, they come from a place of complete purity with absolutely no sin and radical love for you. And so that is the father that you're praying to. And he says, and when you understand that, then pray that kingdom come. Bring heaven down. Bring heaven down into any situation in your life. Because we can bring heaven down through prayer. That is God's desire. That's God's desire. Are you struggling in a relationship? Invite heaven into that relationship. Invite heaven into your bedroom with your husband. Invite heaven into that work position. In fact, invite heaven into your home with your family. Thy kingdom come. Father, I want heaven on earth in my family. We're struggling. We're not going to get along. I don't even think I like my kids. But I invite heaven into that situation. Okay, bring heaven down into every situation in life. Because you see, the thing is, the Bible says that we are the salt of the earth. And it truly is God's desire that our conversations, that our lives would be seasoned with the seasons of heaven. That it, that it would have kingdom flavor. Kingdom um, flavors would come into our homes, into our conversations, into the very atmosphere of our lives. And I'm going to close with this. You know, a wise man once said, to be loved by God is the highest relationship, the highest position, and it is the highest achievement in life. And in Jesus, we have all of that. And he, and so perfect love is reaching down to you. And he wants you to take hold of his hand. And I encourage you to put your heart in his hand. Remember, he created it. And you put your heart in his hand, hold onto his hand and never let go and so there's a story in Genesis 5 2 the Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was no more that's it <laughs> and but you know the amazing thing about that story is I heard a pastor say it like this he said you know it's kind of like this like Enoch developed a personal relationship with God the Father and he held on to his hand and one day, Enoch was telling God the Father, you know, I met this girl, and she's, like, amazing. Like, I want to marry her. Like, everything, she reminds me of you. And God the Father begins to talk to him and says, yes, I send her to you. She's my gift to you. And let me teach you how to love her. 
and let me teach you how she, she will best respond to you in a way that honors that, that it will be a reflection of what I've intended marriage to be. And then, of course, it, it all works out. And then he talks to him about his children. And he invites him into his home. And he invites him into every relationship in his life. But at the end of the day, Enoch's favorite thing is to walk with God. And they go on these long walks and they spend time together. Because this is where he receives empowerment for life. And then one day, as Enoch gets older in life, um, God the Father looks at him and says, You know, son? It looks like we're closer to my house than yours. How about we just go to my house? Bless you. <laughs>